Welcome everyone, fellow Noahides, Jews, and truth seekers, to our latest episode of Guide for the Noahide Study. Yes, Abigail is not with us tonight as she is out doing important work in the community, but she'll be returning next week. And it will smell nicer. Yes, probably. <laughs> but in the meantime, me this week we will be continuing our study <clears throat> of Guide for the Noahide in the introduction on page 11 towards the middle. And as always, if you don't have this book, go out and get the book at Amazon.com or at LightcatcherBooks.com. And you can even buy a Kindle edition. You can go and download it right now and follow along with us. Yeah, that's the way to do it. Now, here we start off, actually pick up where we left off last time when we were in the section on Noahide justice in proper perspective, answering the fear mongers and anti-Semites. Uh, just a quick recap, as many of us who have, have come to the path of Torah, we find that it is uh, Israel that has kept not just the Torah, the Word of God, but the, the entire tradition for knowing our laws when, in truth, long ago, our ancestors had abandoned the ancient path of God. But it was they, Israel, who preserved this. Now that we've come to this, we find that we learn from them. And that uh, with the help of Hashem, we ourselves will be strengthened so that we can be responsible for ourselves in helping to create uh, a more godly society. So when it comes to this, right, especially in a society as ours, which uh, prizes uh, independence of thoughts and, uh, and uh, independence of uh, sovereignty, Right, then there comes an issue of okay, learning from uh, another from another people, but when looking in historical context, we have to see okay, where has the real harm lie uh, throughout history, right? When the people who want to uh, want to uh, lob insults and even libels against the Jewish people, yet it is coming from the very the kinds of people themselves who have help to perpetrate the evil throughout time, violating God's law in the process. So part of what we're learning here in this section is to put this in the proper perspective, seeing how it is that really that, that Hashem's own people are trustworthy in learning our laws. Anything to uh, add to that? No, let's jump right in. All right, very good. So here we're picking up, again, on the middle of page 11. It is expressly taught in Mishneh Torah, the ultimate code of Jewish law, that tyrannizing other peoples is not a goal of the Jewish people, not now or ever. According to our divine mandate, the purpose of the Jewish people is to sanctify the name of Hashem in this world by the fulfilling of His commandments. It's detailed in Mishneh Torah, Book of Knowledge, Laws and Foundations of Torah, Chapter 5. Our desire is to be free to delve as deeply into Torah and know Hashem to the extent we are able not to lord over anyone. As the Ramban teaches, quote, the prophets and sages did not longingly desire the days of the Messiah in order to rule the entire world and not in order to tyrannize the Gentiles and not so that the peoples would raise them up as rulers and not in order to eat, drink, or enjoy themselves but rather so that they would be free for the study of Torah and its wisdom, and they would have no taskmaster or disturbance in order that they should merit the life of the world to come, which can be found in the Laws of Kings and Wars in chapter 12. And he continues, Those who slander the Noahide laws comfortably ignore the breadth of the oral law, which is saturated with teachings of peace and goodwill towards idolaters. The oral law is protective of property and welfare of Gentiles to the extent that stealing, even from an idolater, is considered worse than stealing from a Jew. And the self is taken from uh, the Rambam's commentary to the Mishnah. Uh, pause. And you... actually, go ahead and read up until the next uh, section header. Certainly. Okay. <clears throat> and then so, we'll discuss. So continuing. 
Most, if not all, of the above-mentioned hate groups would do well to preach to the mirror. As white supremacists and neo-Nazis, they incite violence against innocents and identify with those who committed the worst genocide in known history. What Jewish or Jewish-aligned group ever perpetrated such crimes? They neither understand nor do they care about the proper context of these laws. Such slanders conveniently ignore that outside of Israel, these laws were intended to be adjudicated by non-Jews in their own courts, not by Jewish courts or Jewish judges. Justice for non-Jewish communities is their own responsibility and obligation, not anyone else's. For those who cannot imagine how society could feasibly be so greatly transformed, consider the following. When Israel came out of Egypt, they were almost totally assimilated into the idolatry of Egypt. But Hashem led the people of Israel through a 40-year process of transformation to its unique God-given system of government before entering the land where all the commandments would be in force. It is reasonable to assume that by the legislative enactment of a true Sanhedrin in Israel, an entire society that adopts the Noahide Covenant could be allowed a gradual process of transformation to national life according to the seven laws. All right. He brings forth a lot of interesting points here. Um, a lot of people, you know, a lot of people, especially ex-Christians, are very familiar with the idea of the Messianic Age, mm. or the Messianic Era. But very few of them have actually really learned from the Torah, or from the Torah, what the Messianic Era actually consists of. You know, like, right. what are the details of it? Because we learn that from the sages, even right. in the well, Mishnah Torah. The, but even so, if you're talking about the Messianic Era, I mean... Wouldn't this be the kind of age where everything will just be more spiritual? We may even have spiritual bodies, no? No, no, no not way. at all. It won't be, it's nothing like that. In fact, the Rambam explicitly goes into detail explaining that in the Messianic era, there won't necessarily be miracles. There won't be, effectively, nothing in the normal course of nature will change at all. Everything will be just like it is. People will still have to eat. People will live and die. It's, it's no different. The only think, difference... Ah, I was going to ask, well, what then is the difference? There will be one difference, effectively. And that is simply that the entire world will know God and they will follow his Torah. That's it. That's the only difference. So it's life today, but with everyone following Torah properly. And ultimately, that is what changes the world. You could say, essentially, a change of heart uh, in the essence or in the inclination of humanity. It's hard to believe as it may seem. However, if we recall the prophecy of... Uh, what, what? I was going to say, uh, you, you make a good point. It's like, in reality, what's more miraculous? You know, like fish and food flying out of the sky and miracles constantly happening or everyone on earth changing their hearts and doing the right thing <laughs> well i'd say it would be easier to have like you know food flying out of the sky <laughs> well there is even uh, i have to be in careful here because I, uh, I saw something and won't give me more detail other than and i think you've saw seen this as well like the possibility of even a regenerating life yeah life. yeah i mean it, it it's in uh the germinating stages, but uh, even that is possible. To, um, anyone true. who's connected with the web knows what is happening right now. The very things that were considered science fiction, okay, not too long ago, are very, if not fact now, will be very much so very soon. And yet, we are dealing with a lot of the same problems as before, with the same kind of, you know, appetites that remain unrestrained because people act as if there is no master of the world. And we speak not just of, you know, ordinary people like, you know, sinner friends, okay, but those also who rule, those who have the power to do good, but instead twist it to do evil. It's something that we all still wrestle with. Now, not to get too far off track, but again, what Jacob was mentioning here about uh, the messianic era, right? When we're 
when uh, here, as we, we talk about, all right, the future, what is seen here? Remember, part of this stems from the prophetic vision of Yirmiyahu, Jeremiah, when he said, when he said that Hashem, he will make a new brief, or a new covenant with his people, a heart of flesh, and that the Torah will be written on their hearts. Now, many who are watching have uh, come to realize that obviously this was the new brief, the new covenant, and not refer to you know who, but rather a new, it was really the same, I would you say, the same kind of relationship that Hashem has with his people, uh, with Israel, with, through the Torah. But, however it would come about, that there would be a change in their own hearts. And if it is possible with them, it is possible even with humanity, with the help of Hashem. It's true. It's true. And even our teachers have taught us that the whole idea of the Torah being written on the nation of Israel's heart doesn't mean that somehow, you know, a magical finger will reach in and go and write the Torah, mm -hmm. but rather that they will memorize the Torah. They will literally have learned it by heart. And every every member of the nation of Israel will just know the Torah mm -hmm. and be able to quote it and and breathe it and, and eat it. And part of that, Drink I think, it. Jacob, now that I'm thinking about this, you know, what does it take to, uh, to how would you say, for this to become the people's main occupation? It's, in a way, we, re we had the same difficulties as we did before as far as just simply trying to struggle to make a living. But now, with popular culture, and, you know, and look, we're, we're children <laughs> of that environment as well, the distractions that come with that. Really, as we are here on earth, to know true pleasure in serving Hashem according to His will. It's true. Essentially. Now, now my point in bringing this, yes. this whole thing up about the Messianic Sorry to spiral off. We'll bring back here. Not so much about um, how the Messianic era will play out for Israel. Because a lot of people are somewhat familiar with that, that Israel will be free from oppression. Israel will have its kingdom restored. The temple will be restored and the service will, will start there again. You know, these things are all well known and people think about this. But what happens outside of Israel? Mm -hmm. That's something a lot of yes. people don't really consciously think through. Like, what will happen in America in the Messianic era? What will happen in, like, Zaire or anywhere else in the world outside of Israel? What, how will life change there? And the point is, life will change there, and that's part of what we've been discussing in this chapter, in that all of the peoples of the world will follow Torah once again. And we won't, we won't simply be following these seven laws as a means of, like, self-perfection, and, you know, I'm trying to be a better person, and so on and so forth, but we'll actually start to implement these laws as a way of improving and changing our own societies and our mm -hmm. own purifying our own cultures and lifting them up. So if you've been studying Torah for any period of time, you're probably familiar with the idea that when we, when we do miswot, when we actually keep God's laws, these laws are designed as a way to actually improve us as people. Each of the laws that God commanded us is designed to actually perfect us perfect our character and make us better people and raise us higher, right? But another aspect of these laws is that they are actually designed not just to improve us, but to improve our societies and to improve the world. So when we as groups of people actually keep these laws and do them, our societies become perfected and they become lifted up as well. So ultimately what happens is that once these laws are implemented on a, on a larger scale within our communities, our communities will actually start to become perfected and they, they themselves will, will lift up. We'll find ourselves living in a place and time where we don't fear locking our doors anymore. People know their neighbors and, and trust each other. You know, it's, it won't be like now where, where we 
in a lot of ways, a lot of people live in constant fear of their neighbors and in fear of violence happening to them or um, their stuff being stolen or uh, there's, yeah, I mean, we live in kind of an age of fear in a sense, which is strange because we actually live in an age where like violent crime has decreased tremendously. And mm-hmm. all of these, all of these horrible things that used to be very common in the past, like, you know, in America, we don't see bands of goons like running through the streets, raping and pillaging people and carrying them off into the wilderness. Baruch Hashem. Mm. But people are still afraid of things like that happening. Um, really, uh, I was thinking of this before. You see, that uh, a lot of what has occurred in our world, a lot of the great blessings that uh, Menavision could only at a certain time imagine have now come to be our reality, right? Such as uh, the abundance of food in many parts of the world, right? And the kind of technology that has not only been able to uh, connect us to, to shorten distance, but even has reached the point to where even cancer, as, as horrible as it is, for some people now it's almost like, uh, well, I got cancer, and uh, but they may be actually be able to be healed of it. It's not yeah. such an impossibility as it was not so long ago. There are many other examples of how the world has come forward. Now, one might then think, ah, well, you know, this has come about to the hand of you know, many, many people who consider themselves secular. Okay, Hashem gives skill and gives a reward to those who to those who seek it out who involve themselves we, you could say that really we've coming close to the messianic age and the only thing we have yet to acknowledge is just to give gratitude to the creator if there's any time in his, human history when there should be acknowledgement of the holy one blessed be he is now I mean, you consider uh, you know, you hear tales of, uh, you know, what life was like before, you know, well, in my day, uh, life was, this is all I got, it was just a pittance to eat, I had to sleep my head, uh, you know, you know, I had a rock for a pillow, and I walked five miles to school and ten miles to work, you ever seen a Monty Python sketch the four Yorkshire men? Check it out, you know what I mean. <laughs> What's the point? Is having <coughs> gratitude, even for the simplest, smallest things, and now, in our time, such abundance and there's a, yet there's a prophecy about the messianic era that the the delights of the world will be as common as dust mm-hmm. and that's starting to happen today mm-hmm. the nice thing is it's it's humanity's job to improve the world and to improve the lot of mankind and the good thing is we've been doing our job ultimately despite all the hardship despite how far we still have to go as a species we've been progressing forward and that's good. But mm-hmm. don't get us wrong. It, yeah. it doesn't mean that there aren't horrible things in the world today. There still are. Like uh, things like the, the mass kidnapping, the Boko Haram kidnapping. These mm-hmm. are horrible things. But the thing that we should look at and take heart, heart because of is that these things used to happen on a daily basis everywhere. But now when they happen in some faraway place, it makes the news and the entire world is aghast at how horrible it is. That's the reaction people should have. And that's good. Mm -hmm. It's not good that it happened, God forbid. But it's good that the world looks at it and goes, this is terrible. And we, we then try to actually think of solutions to all of these matters, right? That there, we don't hide, we don't hide our head in, heads in the sand, or we just cower with fear. Uh, although there are some other events where some people have chosen to react in such a way, but the point is that we're becoming more aware of the uh, of the the reality that it is in our hand to do good and to improve things. This is a Torah value. You don't get this from Rome. You don't get this from Greece. Okay. As much as there is wisdom that God had bequeathed to the nations, it is the Torah. And it's through these nations that however they took the Torah and through their distorted uh, lenses, okay, 
as time has moved on, with that thirst for seeking truth, many people have come to, you know, come to realize that there is simply the Torah. Now, when we talk about our own laws, okay, one of the, one of the most foundational ones, the foundational one, which we will get to, is the laws regarding Abu Dazara, or strange service, otherwise known as idolatry. And one might think, okay, in some ways it might be easy to figure out, okay, well, don't worship in this way and that way. What are we talking about? Ultimately, through studying the laws of idolatry, we start to learn about the truth of the Creator. Because it's not only just something social, but it's something that goes to our very soul. How do we know the Creator? And the more we know, the more we see that the, the, the God that is taught through the Torah is, becomes increasingly very different than the God that we were raised with. And I think that's, that's also a cause for where people can be uh, uh, pulled astray, either to do evil or uh, give up hope in some way and start to rely only on their own devices alone to help them along. Why? Because people can still hold very wrong and even dangerous ideas about the Creator, about the One God. It, it would go into, and, and we can go into that further when we get into that section uh, on the laws of idolatry. But... Now to bring this, it, oh, let me yes. bring this back to Maury's point real quick about, he mentions here that um, the fact that when Yisrael left um, Egypt, right? They went through a process of they, basically they wandered for 40 years in the desert, but this wasn't pointless wandering. This was basically they were going through a process of purification and they were even many of the, the Torah commandments that they were given at Mount Sinai didn't actually kick into effect until after these 40 years were up when they actually entered the land. So in a sense they were going through a transformation process of being a society that was idolaters and slaves in Egypt and becoming a righteous nation that served Hashem over this 40-year period. Mm -hmm. And now Mori brings forth that perhaps the nations could go through a process like this. But I would say there's no perhaps to it. We've been going through this process. Hashem mm -hmm. is currently giving us our opportunity to gradually change. Hashem, we were... Our ancestors were like complete, full-on idolaters. And Hashem created Christianity and Islam, right? And the Rambam brings this forth, is that these have not been pointless things, but Hashem has used these where previously there were just idolaters who knew their own pantheon of gods, and that's all they knew. Now there's peoples, still idolaters, but the words of Torah are on our lips. We're holding the books of Torah in our hands. People are familiar with concepts like Moshiach and Messianic era. These are not foreign concepts to us, and he's given us a gradual period in which to learn these things and, and, and accept them and understand them. Mm -hmm. And that's something that really needs to be internalized, that, that helps to give really just a more positive outlook on life in the world that we've learned other Torah values in addition to this idea or this concept of a, a messianic era, which really is referring not to an era, less about an era of, you know, some cult of personality, uh, because really he is a, for Israel, a vessel for helping to uh, expedite the means of restoring the priestly kingdom. Another subject. What the, the majority of the prophet's visions is an era in which people know and serve God, not just Israel, but all the world, right? Right. And it is, you, we can see when we look back in history, when we stand on this mountain and we look back, and we see it is Hashem's compassion that over time that, uh, that we, I can speak more for, okay, uh, peoples you know, in Europe and the northern parts of the world that is taking the Torah where it became corrupted with a lot of other idolatrous uh, customs and practices and so forth. As time has moved on, it, it's, it's as if when the 
seed of Torah takes root, there's no stopping it. It's going to grow, right? Ultimately, the, the emerging Noahide movement today is the culmination of this gradual process of transformation that we've been going through for thousands of years in the nations. Yes. So, Baruch Hashem for that. Yes. In our next section. Yes. Okay. On page 13, towards the top. Okay, here we go. Beyond the wisdom, beauty, and fairness of the Noahide laws, however abrasive they may be to currently widespread notions of political correctness, they need not impress. They must ultimately be accepted because they are Torah law according to the oral tradition. Those who reject the Noahide laws invariably reject the oral law to begin with. They imagine the ancient rabbis to have been corrupt legislators who added laws against the Torah pro prohibition to do so. And in uh, Deuteronomy 13.1, God forbid. They imagine that such rabbinical legislation came to replace an original, pure biblical Judaism. To refute such nonsense, I refer the reader to my soon-to-be-published work. Uh, he had one title in here, but the uh, working title is Oral Torah from Sinai. Yes, and it's not soon to be published anymore. Yes. It was published previously. Yes, right. And you can also order that off of Lightcatcher Books or on Amazon.com. Yes. Yes. Uh, he says here, I offer proofs from the Bible, other ancient literature, archaeology, and ethnic studies to establish the deep antiquity, biblical authenticity, and divine sanction of the oral law. The reader is shown how, beginning with the first court of 70 elders, ordained by Moses, Hashem appointed the great court, the Sanhedrin, to be the bastion of an unbroken oral tradition from Sinai. In the written Torah, God himself establishes their authority in every generation. That includes the authority to enact original decrees in their own name, lacking the same force as God's original 613 commandments, a power we see exercised and recognized by God and the prophets in the Bible itself. It is impossible for Jew or non-Jew to fulfill the written word of God except according to that oral body of instruction. In the days of Rabbi Judah the Prince, or Rabbi Yehuda HaNasi, lived in the 2nd century CE, that was uh, a few generations after the fall of the temple, maybe rebuilt speedily, the ordained sages of Israel were forced by circumstance to create an official written court record of the oral tradition. They produced the Mishnah, which recorded the authoritative traditions, interpretations, and rulings of Israel's ordained sages since the 70 elders under Moses at Sinai until their day, uh, which is uh, listed in the introduction to the Mishnah Torah. You can read that. Thus began a process by which ordained sages of each generation, both in Israel and Babylonia, would expound on the Mishnah, record their authoritative traditions, and further clarify the law. As explained in the preface, the process was, was complete with the sealing of the Babylonian Talmud circa 500 CE. The Talmudic literature remains the final repository of the legal traditions of the last Sanhedrin. Thanks to the tireless efforts of those sages over the span of three centuries, the authentic oral law of Moses is in our hands today well intact. Okay, so there could be many things to comment on here so that uh, people have, again, an understanding. And we have actually gone into, uh, actually, uh, quite some depth about this in our earlier episodes. Yes. Explaining uh, the oral Torah. But uh, just to recap, uh, really, when you talk about living the Word of God, He does give laws. And this is, the other, this is the, one of the things that we, in, coming from a Christian culture, is something that we need to, internalize and we need to embrace the christian culture taught that there was uh, you know, only the word of god and nothing else but there was never any clear definition on what was there ever a time when anyone could even agree on the simplest things when god said you shall not murder you shall not steal you shall not commit adultery you shall honor your father and mother right and was there uh, even an agreed-upon definition in any time in the history of Christendom? Not that I know of. 
And, the, and if, there, if there's a problem then, even more so now. They're only just general ideas. But there is something worth commenting on here, since, uh, since he does uh, mention this, okay, where he says, they, the uh, opponents of oral Torah, they imagine such rabbinic legislation came to replace an original, pure biblical Judaism. Now, why do I say this? I notice a lot of people who are most vocal and uh, and uh, you know railing against the oral Torah are usually part of a movement of various kinds of roots movements to return to some uh, uh, imagined uh, time, a biblical time, right? Mainly with messianics, Hebrew roots, and various weird expressions of uh, lost tribe or uh, nonsense, and, and it really is nonsense, okay? I'll go into, you know, who are the what and the where. And it, there's always two ways to look at it. There are, in, in the worst way, why do they rail against this, right? The, and it's just the same people, again, not just, okay, Messianics or, or Hebrew roots, lost tribers, and s certain strains of uh, Christianity and so forth. Because then that crowds out, that means they don't have a monopoly to say, to interpret uh, to interpret the Torah. They think that they have it because they believe in this, this, you know, uh, personal, divine, re direct revelation. Each and every person. They still can't agree. Even though they each have the Holy Spirit, but they just can't, uh, you know, they can't agree. But they, they hate that because then that's where the rubber meets the road. How do you actually apply these laws? And that's why people, we need to look to the establishment of, of or the restoration of Israel. This is not just some matter of uh, secular politics. You talk to Jews who return to Israel and they, they will tell you that this is, again, who they are. J that Jews, they're not part of a like blood race, nor are they a religion. They are a nation. And in that part of the world, where God gave that land to them to manage they have to find. They have to create that kind of society, right? It flows. It is organic, and that requires simply following along, someone teaching you, showing you, not just from a book, but showing you how do you observe the laws of God, and it is exactly the same with us, because after all, before the Torah was given at Mount Sinai, okay, how did anyone know? about Torah. How did anyone know about Hashem's laws, which are stated here in the Torah, both in, in chapter 18 and later in chapter 25. Speaking of what? Oh, of, uh, of the Torah. Sorry, uh, Breshif. Oh, okay. Genesis. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, you can look it up in Genesis in chapters 18 and chapters uh, and 25, where Hashem speaks of Abraham and the way that he followed his commandments his Torah, his laws. He's very specific about that. Well, see, this is, I was going to disagree with you slightly before, but you've, you've looped back around to what I was going to actually kind of touch on. Oh, please. Because um, you were saying that the, the impulse that people have to like go back to some pure biblical form of Judaism is kind of silly. And I was going to say, mm. no, I don't think well, that that's a silly or a bad impulse necessarily. I think that's good because I know with a lot, with us even, this is what drew us out of Christianity. We looked at what Christianity was and we said, this is wrong. This is not the pure form of truth that we see in the Torah itself. This is not what this was supposed to be. And that drew us out of that and back to Torah, ultimately. But I think what people do is that they don't follow that impulse far enough. They stop. Mm -hmm. They stop at some arbitrary point and they say, the Torah was written down by Moshe in writing on this at this time, and that's where I'm stopping. That's the, the ultimate truth. But it's like, wait a minute, you got to go back further. <clears throat> Keep digging further for truth because where did Moshe didn't grow up an idolater. He learned Torah from his parents, right? But that was before Mount Sinai. Where did he get that? What book did he read? There wasn't one. He was taught the oral Torah, 
which came from his parents, which came from the patriarchs, Avraham, Yisach, and Yaakov. But they didn't make it up. They learned it from Shem and Eva, who learned it in turn from Noah, who learned it all the way back from Mount, you know, all the way back to Adam, ultimately. And this was passed down orally, entirely. They didn't, they didn't have scrolls. They didn't have books they were passing down. They passed down this knowledge as an oral tradition. And it wasn't written down until the time of Moshe. But would it make sense that what had been an oral tradition up to that point would suddenly be like, oh yeah, here we've written it down. And now there's no more oral tradition. Stop doing that silliness. Mm -hmm. No. Of course, there was still an oral tradition and a written tradition that supported it. And that's what continued forward. So keep, keep following that impulse further back. And you'll see it only makes sense that there's still an oral tradition and there always has been. And thank you for bringing me, bringing me back on track because I started off saying the two ways that you can look at this and I was addressing uh, the negative aspect of this, the part of it where they want to stop. The positive thing, which I, I went off track and I forgot, but the positive part is that people are trying to look for something authentic, and that, that's really the era in which we find ourselves. In, in the, you can still consider this the post-war era. Uh, that this is something that started in the 1950s and 1960s, where people were looking for something more authentic than the world that was given them. And that's something that still characterizes our age. And a lot of times, um, sadly, it manifests itself in a lot of distrust and cynicism. And we can see why when we see that the uh, the facades of our society they could be overly materialistic and so forth we find that it's uh, not as how would you say um it's just not something eternal and we find that the figures in which we are told to place our trust they let us down and so forth and that's where people are going to to seek again seek for okay what is true there's a hebrew word tadem and it's spelled the kof dalet mensof or Q E uh, Q E D E M Kedem, it means east. It also means from the beginning or from the principle, returning to the ancient sources. So again, addressing the particular group of people and the kinds of people I mentioned, Jacob and I, uh, in our own search had and others that we know had come through that. Right? Why are people going back and looking for this? Authentic biblical Judaism, oftentimes, just looking at just the Kohanim, the, the priests, and the Levites alone who ruled, and not these, you know, not these rabbis. The positive part is that they're looking for the restoration of the kingdom, the kingdom of Israel, and it, it gets all, it does get mixed up because uh, they they think that it's going to be, you know, Yashki who's who's going to be ruling and all this and that. But again, the other side of it, what Jacob was mentioning. The positive impulse is that, is that there is a reality of divine providence and blessing in this world that comes primarily through Israel because of their continued faithfulness to their God amidst all these hardships, but also for the world. And again, having that positive outlook, <laughs> I'd say that we, it's, I'd say things are very intense, almost like a tightrope where Things are really bad in one way, but are really good in another way. Yeah, that's true. It's uh, ultimately, it can be very easy to look around at the world today and get very down as to like, oh man, how bad things are becoming, how everything's going down the drain and it's getting worse and worse. But ultimately, if we stop and we look back at how things used to be, and again, going back to the days of old, mm -hmm. we see that actually things are getting better and better in a lot of ways. In most of the ways, even, things are getting even better and better every day. People are becoming more sensitive to truth. People are becoming more offended by horrible bad things, which they used to just be like, eh, yeah, so someone got raped and killed, eh, whatever. Now we find that horrific in our societies as a, like a regular thing. People are not just all around. People are living lives of more wealth. 
lives of more ease um, and in, in, all over the world. And an increase in giving. Yeah. The, the charity and with kindness. People are becoming more generous. They're caring more about other people other than just themselves and their own close circle. So uh, things are actually improving, but we're becoming more hypersensitive to the bad things that occur in the world. So it kind of feels like things are getting worse, even mm -hmm. though they're getting better. Yeah. And ultimately, the final piece in this puzzle of, of things getting better for humanity, you know, as what we're studying here is Torah, morality. That's the final piece that needs to fall into place and that will give us the ability as individuals and as a society to unlock the good that we've actually created in the world. We have enough food to feed everyone and have plenty left over, but we're not distributing it properly. If everyone was righteous, mm -hmm. we'd be distributing it properly. We would be working on that, and it's a problem we could solve, and we would. With the and help we, of Hashem. Yes, and we will. Be'ezrath, with Hashem's help. One more thing, just to clarify, when we talk about trying to return to the sources and uh, how that how that impulse arises uh, in the midst of all this wealth, we're not talking about, okay, uh, some people, this happened a lot in the 60s and 70s where people just threw it all off and they went out into the woods, you never heard from them again. God forbid. <laughs> we're not talking about some kind of Luddite thing, okay? No, no. no. But it's, it's the balance, it's rather the harmony between the wisdom and the knowledge that that has been given to us by God. Okay, if anything, this should show us. I mean, the more that we see in the world, the less that there that there uh, it, it's more. It shows more that there is a creator, and less that there is this thing called randomness and chance. Honestly, yes, okay, it's true. But it's that balance between a world where. Uh, where many pe people from many uh, of the nations have actually affected the world in a positive way, as well as raising up one another, that next step is to get past a lot of the... Well, as Dennis, as a noted uh, Jewish talk show host Dennis Prager would put it, uh, our one, one way of looking at our task on earth is to battle our nature with the, with the help of God. But overcoming that... And to be a truly united nations is one that recon yes, and we'll say recognizes the people of Israel as the ones who had done a lot of the work for us, who had spread the seeds of Torah, of the light of God. The values that we hold ultimately are coming back from that. And that's what we're talking about returning to the sources, both with the written and the oral Torah, with the restoration of Israel and even with the restoration of the, the house of worship and with the Sanhedrin with a true just judgment and then learning from that elder sibling nation look it up in Exodus 4.22 that this is with, with the help of God this is what can what can will can and will bring us in to that era of true peace right and this is what what ultimately will will how do i put this this is what will be accomplished by the nations in the messianic era is that we will take the things that we as individual nations have accomplished over all these centuries that we've existed and we will apply the Torah that Hashem, that Hashem has given Yisrael for us, that they have preserved, and we will apply that to ourselves and unlock our potential. And we as nations will actually be able to fulfill our potential properly, the way we were always meant to, mm -hmm. and help one another and really make this world a better place. And that's, that's what lies in wait for us as as non-Israelites, as the nations of the world in the Messianic era. Mm -hmm. That's what we have to look forward to. Yes. So. I was smiling because there is uh, a prophecy. Everyone knows from uh, Sephaniah, from uh, Zephaniah, 
in chapter 3, verse 9, when, Hashem, when he says that there will be a day when Hashem will purify the lips of the peoples and they will serve Hashem as with... the, the it's, it's said in, uh, in English as uh, with one consent. Literally, the term in Hebrew is Shechem Achav. Shechem Achav, which means one shoulder. Does that mean one shoulder? As if everyone is sharing the burden. Not by some kind of an autocratic state decree, all right? But neither is it a world where everyone is just free to run willy-nilly willy -nilly to this total anarchy. It is a balance. And it, this is interesting because it's really an answer, you could say, a message of hope from the original sin, I don't mean capital O, capital S, but the original sin at Nezdal Bavel, the Tower of Bavel, the first United Nations, and they were all gathered, and they, and they, they worked with one another. There, there was, to say to say, there was a love for everyone in that generation. But what was their chief goal? What was their chief project? Let's fight heaven. Okay. Rebel against God. Yeah. But in the future, these prophets saw, and keep in mind, when the prophets came, it's, just, it's not for nothing that their messages came when they did and for posterity, because it came at the darkest times uh, of Israel's existence. That in those days, that we will ourselves return in a sense, it, uh, make our own teshuvah, even on a ma who knows on a massive scale for the own errors of our fathers before us. It's so true, and there's there's a, there's a beauty in this story that a lot of people miss, I think, um, which is there's a principle when Hashem judges us, He judges us measure for measure, right? The uh, the the judgment that He brings down is always fitting with. The sin that was that was done. So what happened at that time is that the people gathered together in unity and love of one another, and rebelled against God, right? So what was the punishment? He separated them. He split them and sent them to the you know he he confused their tongues and basically split them apart. And basically, the judgment was essentially you will never be able to come together as people because of your love for each other, because your languages are different, your cultures are different, your nations are different, you'll never be able to fit back together again unless one thing happens. Unless you all come together because you love me, because you love Hashem. Like not Jacob, so, but... No, not me, not me. I mean, <laughs> unless you love Hashem. So the one thing that they refused to do when they were together in love for each other is the only thing that will actually bring them together in the end, which is their love for God. So it's the perfect judgment for that situation. And ultimately, that's what we will fix when we all come and accept Torah. Then the nations of the world will be able to reunite. With Hashem's help. Indeed. It'll be a great day. Okay. Or so, a week, or maybe a month. It will be a, a long time. <laughs> yes. Long after we go, after we're gone, and the generations after us, Bezerat Hashem, uh -huh. it will be a better day for them. Yes, may it happen soon, Amen. even in our day. Okay, so we will stop here for this week. So, uh, thank you again, everyone, uh, for joining us uh, for our study. And if you have uh, any questions or comments, you can put them down in the comment sections below, or you can uh, contact us at uh, beingnoahide.com. Yes, indeed. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again next time. Very good. May Hashem be with you, be with all of us in our endeavors throughout the week. Amen. Oh,